Welcome once again to Lato's Law. Here's Steve Lato. I had a whole bunch of people send me this story, and this kind of ends one saga, but it ends with a whimper instead of a good old-fashioned bang. So you'll recall the uh, Subway tuna sandwich lawsuit where a plaintiff alleged that after eating some Subway tuna sandwiches, discovered that the sandwiches contained zero tuna. That was one of the allegations made at one point in the litigation. The lawsuit got filed, and along the way, I mentioned all these other lawsuits where people were suing over the contents of food. So, you know, does a strawberry Pop-Tart contain any actual strawberries and so on? But, of course, the Subway tuna sandwich lawsuit, I believe, was at the forefront of this litigation. And so here's the deal. The woman who sued over Subway tuna seeks to quit the case And Subway is demanding sanctions. And so here's the thing. When you file a lawsuit against somebody and they get served with a lawsuit and they defend themselves, you can't just walk into court and go, oh, I changed my mind. I will now dismiss the lawsuit. Thank you very much. Sorry to bother you, Your Honor. See ya. It's not how it works. And um, it's a little disturbing because some of the articles I saw in the headlines said things such as, she has withdrawn her suit implying that that's something she can do, which it is not. So uh, the version of the story I got here is from Reuters. Jonathan Stemple wrote it. Uh, The California woman who filed the suit against Subway, and in it she had claimed its tuna products contain ingredients other than tuna, does want to end her lawsuit. And she says because she's pregnant and the uh, demands on her of the pregnancy are too much that she cannot do both the lawsuit and the pregnancy, So she'd like to continue with the pregnancy and and drop the lawsuit. So that prompted Subway to demand that her lawyers be sanctioned for bringing a frivolous case. And the interesting thing, of course, is, is if this case is based on allegations that are true, it wouldn't be that hard to find somebody else who bought a Subway tuna sandwich. It shouldn't be, right? I mean, they've sold more than one, I would think. So the woman said her severe morning sickness and debilitating conditions as she prepares for a third child have left her unable to proceed with her obligations as plaintiff and require her to focus on her health and her family. And I have no doubt about any of that. I have no doubt about any of that. But that, of course, is simply her explanation as to why she wants to do what she wants to do. But the thing is that the rules are there for everyone to follow. What do the rules say? We'll get there. So she wants to dismiss the case from federal court in San Francisco, but she wants to dismiss it without prejudice, which means that that would allow her to refile it in the future, possibly, if she chose to do so. Uh, And it gets dismissed with prejudice. I mean, she, she cannot file that suit again. So in a May 4th filing, Subway said the woman's excuse flunked the straight face test, and her lawyers likely realized it would not simply pay the windfall settlement they hoped to get by constructing a high-profile shakedown. So that's what Subway is characterizing his case as. Subway also said the media frenzy from this lawsuit caused them severe harm, and they faulted the plaintiff's ever-changing legal theories to debunk its claim that his tuna sandwiches, salads, and wraps contained 100% tuna. Because like I said, I believe she's amended her complaint, and I believe that her legal theories have changed at least once. The chain wants the proposed class action dismissed, and they want someone, possibly her seven lawyers, to pay at least $600,000 of its legal bills. Uh, Meanwhile, her lawyers did not immediately respond on Monday to requests for comment. The plaintiff claimed to have ordered Subway tuna products more than 100 times before suing back in January of 2021. She accused Subway of using other fish, chicken, pork, and cattle in its tuna products, or no tuna at all. Meanwhile, uh, last July, a U.S. district judge uh, let the case proceed but rejected her claim that reasonable consumers expect only tuna and nothing else, calling it a fact of life that ingredients such as mayonnaise might be used in a tuna sandwich. And so apparently at one point, the court said, Uh, It appears the plaintiff wants to argue that if there's anything in that sandwich besides tuna, then she'd win. Well, a tuna sandwich would contain mayonnaise. So obviously there can be other things in there. It's a question of, is there literally no tuna and something substituting for the tuna that would be inappropriate? That's the real question. 
Meanwhile, Subway has nearly 37,000 restaurants in more than 100 countries. The case is still active in the Northern District of California, and so we'll see what happens. But here is the thing. Federal court case out of California. Federal courts follow the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, the FRCP. Every law student knows that and fears them. And most state courts have their own system of rules as to how things proceed in courts. So Michigan has the Michigan court rules, the MCRs. And so I know both sets very well because I'm licensed to practice in federal court and in Michigan state court. I spend more of my time in Michigan state court, and many of the rules are similar to each other. And so I can tell you that, for instance, both sets of rules say what kinds of things you can file with the court, what kinds of things constitute pleadings. And then, of course, when pleadings are required, when they're not required, when they're optional, when they can be filed, when it's too late to file them, what to do if you missed your filing deadline, and so on. And so one of the questions becomes, if you file a lawsuit against somebody, a complaint, you file it with the court, you get the complaint and the summons back, and then you have the defendant served. They've been served with the complaint. At what point can you simply decide, I'm simply going to dismiss my case and walk away from it? Or is there a point where you can no longer do that? And the answer, of course, is yes, there is. So if I file a complaint with the court and I'm looking at it and I change my mind, I can dismiss that claim on my own if I have not served it on the other side and the other side has taken no action, okay? And I'll, I'll get the court rule in a second. And so that's something that makes sense if you changed your mind before you served it. But if you file the documents with the court, you get them back and you serve them, you can still voluntarily dismiss the action on your own so long as you do it before the other side files an answer or other acceptable response of pleading. And I'm not going to get into what other acceptable response of pleadings there are. But, but the point is that there does come a time where once the defendant has committed to doing something and invested some time and effort into this, that you can no longer just walk into court and dismiss your case. And it makes sense because otherwise people could file complaints and just drop them, file them, drop them, file and just mess with people. Okay. And, and so they want this to be a very serious process. You need to take it seriously. And so when you file a complaint, understand that you are, you are along for the ride. What I'm talking about here is Rule 41 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, which talks about voluntary dismissal. So voluntary dismissal means that one of the parties is dismissing the case and it, it gets dismissed. So you can file a voluntary dismissal with the court. You do not need anybody else's permission if you do it before an answer or a motion for summary judgment has been filed. Okay, because a motion for summary judgment is a response that took some time. So if you can do it before either of those things happen, you can do it on your own. If, however, the other side's filed an answer or a motion for summary judgment and the case is proceeding, you can also do it by stipulation, meaning if both parties agree. And I have been involved in cases before, for whatever reason, where both parties got together and said, you know something, we should just drop this lawsuit. And by the way, this is how most cases settle. Most cases settle where the parties agree to resolve their claims and then say, let's just stipulate to dismiss the case. So a lot of times you'll hear about cases that got dismissed by stipulation and you don't know what, if anything, was handed back and forth to get someone to agree to dismiss their case. But as you can imagine, if I sue you and I want money damages, you might call me up and say, I'll pay you money damages. I go, okay, I'll dismiss the case if you pay me. And the settlement agreement wouldn't be entered with the court, but the stipulation to dismiss would be along with the then dismissal. So then the question becomes, if there is no stipulation and it's being done after an answer or a motion or summary judgment were filed, then what do you do? And here's the thing. Rule 41 says, otherwise, it can only be done by court order on terms the court deems proper. That's it. Only by court order on terms the court deems proper. So the plaintiff can go into court and say, Your Honor, we asked them to stipulate to dismiss. They won't. We want to dismiss the case. Court then looks at you and says, You want to dismiss the case? Yes. You don't want to dismiss the case? Why not? Because we got $600,000 in attorney fees, we don't think it'd be fair to dismiss the case right now and let them walk away from that. Now, a judge 
could still look at this and go, well, I deem it proper to dismiss the case right now. I want to get this thing off my docket. But probably won't do that. Probably will not do that. And I suspect that the court's going to look at this and go, well, you guys did file a lawsuit and you made a lot of noise about allegations you were going to prove. And here we are a while later. And now you're saying you simply want to drop it and walk away from it. That doesn't seem proper especially to defendants who say that not only do they incur $600,000 in attorney fees, but they also incurred all kinds of damage to their business reputation and goodwill. And as you can imagine, think about this from a policy standpoint, not just this case, but what would happen if they allowed this to happen? What would likely happen is people could file lawsuits and then just dismiss them. They didn't get the money they wanted. And so I suspect what's going to happen here, if I had to guess, is the court is going to say, well, you'd like to withdraw from the case because your plaintiff has medical issues. Doesn't seem to be the defendant's problem, though. Defendants don't want to let you walk away for nothing because they got six hundred grand tied up in this legal fees. Let's hold a hearing and try to determine how much of this uh, is whose fault and how that's going to work out and what would be a proper resolution. And one thing I have to tell you is that if I was the judge on this, I would contact both parties and just say, well, I'm not going to rubber stamp a request for $600,000. I'm going to need to see some billing statements and probably testimony as to how you incurred that kind of money defending this case. And you might have. You might have. However, I'm going to make somebody pay something. Because if you're just dismissing this because your plaintiff got sick, that is not the defendant's fault. So you two probably want to meet in the hallway for a little while, or maybe before that, but figuratively speaking. And if you can't come to a resolution, come to my court on this particular day, and we're going to hold a hearing. We're going to hold a hearing. And I am going to award some money to the defendants for having to defend this case, because this case was so high profile that they obviously would have spent a lot of time defending it, makes complete sense that they did put a lot of time and money into defending it, and therefore they should be compensated for that. So I wouldn't be surprised if this case settles, but like I said before, a case can settle with nothing going on the record other than the stipulation of the parties. So it's quite possible that having been warned that someone's going to pay something, that the plaintiff's attorneys might call up the defense attorneys and go, look, here's what we will pay you if you will agree to stipulate to a dismissal where the terms are confidential. And so it very well could be the next thing we hear is case got dismissed, terms confidential, by stipulation of the parties. And then the question then becomes, do you think they would have had to pay to do that? If I had to guess, I would say yes. But again, I'm speculating because we wouldn't know because the terms would be confidential. So again, the uh, headline I saw where it says that she has withdrawn her lawsuit uh, is uh, not phrased properly because she can only voluntarily dismiss her claim if she did it early enough, which she didn't, or by stipulation of the parties, which as of right now, she does not have. So she can do it by court order on terms the court deems just, Federal Rule of Civil Procedure number 41. And by the way, I got to congratulate my good friend, Mike, one of the people who sent me the story. Mike just got the good news about the bar exam in the state where he resides. And so he can now uh, jump through the last few hoops and become an attorney. So there you go. Congratulations, Mike. But also sent to me by Sean, Al, uh, Johnny, Jason, Bill, Kurt, Thomas, and Mike. From Reuters, Jonathan Stemple wrote it. Woman who sued Subway over the tuna seeks to quit the case and Subway demands sanctions. We'll see what happens. Questions or comments, put them below. Let's talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching Lato's Law. Just do once what others say you can't do, and you will never pay attention to their limitations again.